tonight on The Source. It's the encounter you've been waiting for. Ezra. Ezra. What? He refuses to come on this show, so I took this show to him. Do you still think that people who disagree with you should be put in jail? Tonight, we show you what happens when the lefty's favorite saint, David Suzuki, meets me face to face. It's not your program judges. now. It's a must-see source. <laughs> and it starts right now. For years, Canadians knew David Suzuki as the host of the CBC science program, The Nature of Things. He was a friendly guide for us, explaining the natural wonders of the world, often from exotic and wild locations. But over the years, Suzuki changed. He became more of a celebrity entertainer and less of a scientist, more about politics and less about facts, more about money and less about public service. In a shocking breach of CBC rules about being politically nonpartisan, Suzuki taped a TV ad for the Ontario Liberal Party. And instead of lecturing at schools for the public good, he started touring for his private good, charging students a whopping $30,000 an hour for a visit. Here's his invoice from his recent visit to John Abbott College in Montreal for $41,000, including expenses. And like an aging, eccentric rock star, he didn't just ask for money, but for bizarre contract riders, too, like this request that when he visited that college, that he be escorted by an all-female entourage, college girls only, in his security detail. Here's a college memo about Suzuki's strange request, and I quote, We have learned via Dr. Suzuki's assistant that although the doctor does not like to have bodyguards per se, he does not mind having a couple of ladies, females, that would act as bodyguards, unquote. Ah, like an aging rock star, a little bit demanding, a little bit creepy, too. Suzuki used to be the little guy, but now he's become big business. He incorporated the David Suzuki Foundation that earned a whopping $9 million last year, has $12 million in assets, including more than $10 million in investments. Huh. I wonder what corporations he's invested in. And he started hiring lobbyists. One, then two, then five. Now nine registered lobbyists in Ottawa. On TV, Suzuki built up a reputation as a humble man. Never in a suit and tie, always aw shucks about things, and always weaving in a morality tale about how mankind's appetites are just too big. But in real life, he has the biggest appetites of all. Uh, one of his favorite speeches is a warning that the world is overpopulated and that we're about to run out of resources. But in his own life, he has five children himself. Uh, he declared his support for Occupy Vancouver, the anti-corporate, anti-capitalist street rally for the 99% against the 1%. He gave a speech to them railing against corporations and money. But when he was done his Occupy speech, he went home to his house on Vancouver's elite Point Grey Road, overlooking the Kitsilano Yacht Club, with a gorgeous, unobstructed view of English Bay. It's a double-sized lot. What two regular families would live on, the land alone is assessed by the city of Vancouver at more than $8 million. And that's just one of Suzuki's many homes. He has at least two others, valued at about a million bucks or more. And then there's this head scratcher. I mean, he's got a couple of homes in Vancouver, the main one, and then one on Laburnum Road. He's got a home on Quadra Island, that's his cottage, with a boat dock. I'm sure a fossil fuel hater would never have a boat that uses gasoline, right? But he also co-owns property on Nelson Island, B.C. He co-owns it with an oil company. Kootenai Oil Distributors. Let me say that again. Not only does David Suzuki, the anti-materialist, anti-growth, anti-corporate activist, own one, two, three, four properties in British Columbia alone, but one of them, a large one, he co-owns with an oil company? Huh? How? Why? Now, I'm not saying they're drilling for oil there. I mean, I think it might just be a uh, 
joint ownership, I don't know, a condominium or something they co-own, I don't know. But I do know this. I bet it would shock a lot of Suzuki lovers that the saint himself jointly owns any property in any manner with an oil company. The contradictions keep adding up. The aw shucks little guy who's a big landlord with many properties. The public servant dedicated to our youth who charges schools $41,000 for the pleasure of his company and asks for all-girl bodyguards. The anti-politician cutting TV ads with politicians and hiring nine professional lobbyists to wine and dine Ottawa power players. How does that all work? How can those contradictions be reconciled? And with all of his business ventures, how does he have time to keep up to date with science, the one thing he claims is his expertise? Well, it's tough. It can't bear scrutiny. How many of Suzuki's loyal donors know that he co-owns part of an island with an oil company? What possible explanation for that could square with a lifetime of attacking oil companies? Well, we asked Suzuki for his best explanation of that. Needless to say, he has not responded. But that's the thing. As Suzuki has become bigger and richer and more powerful, as his corporations have grown and his land holdings have grown and his property values have grown and his speaking fee has grown, he has taken more and more steps to shield himself from the kind of public scrutiny that other tycoons and politicians normally endure, the type of scrutiny he himself likes to put on other powerful people in public life. Let me give you just one small example of that. A couple of years ago, Suzuki did a big business deal. His foundation signed a contract with the taxpayer-funded National Film Board to pipe his greatness in by closed-circuit TV to 200 schools across Canada to a captive audience of 12,000 children, kids as young as 13. It was for a political indoctrination session. He talked about everything from the evils of capitalism to how China, the world's most polluted economy, is actually a model of green development, seriously. The real topic of the propaganda hour, though, was himself. And he required each of the participating schools to buy a DVD of his autobiographical movie. Hey, those $8 million homes don't buy themselves. Now, this National Film Board school event was highly scripted. All questions, even from young kids, were vetted in advance. It was highly controlled. But the film board invited the media to come and watch, and so we did. But that's the thing, Suzuki couldn't control us. So when we showed what he was telling these children in their classrooms, with no rebuttal and no counter-arguments to balance his views for the kids, it was disturbing to many parents. That was definitely off script. I mean, here's just one example when Suzuki told the children that the reason he targets schools is so that kids can indoctrinate their parents. Of course, I mean, children aren't ready to debate a slick lobbyist boss. They're easy game, and Suzuki wants them to then take his ideas into their homes. We need to, to educate children, and we need those educated children to influence their parents. Absolutely. Now, we showed a lot of clips like that on TV, and Suzuki did not like that one bit. We know that because when we did an access to information request to the National Film Board, we found this memo. Let me just read a little bit of it to you. Hey, guys, I spoke to Leanne Clare from David Suzuki Foundation yesterday. They had a difficult experience last year with one outlet in particular that subsequently did a series of unflattering pieces. We have had our challenges with this same outlet also. So Leanne is understandably reluctant to issue a news release. However, she was open to inviting a reporter from the Star that they've worked with in the past, Andrea Gordon, and she is okay with letting some local community guys know. Yeah, God forbid anyone is unflattering to the great man himself. By using actual TV footage of what he actually says in those classrooms, yeah, better go to Suzuki's press secretaries at the Toronto Star. Now, this email that we read was from a government organization, the National Film Board, running interference for Suzuki, just like the CBC does, just like... 200 schools did by piping him in directly to their kids. Suzuki hates unflattering media. He hates it. You'd think he would love to debate. He's smooth. He can be very likable. He has a huge fan base. You'd think he'd love the cut and thrust. But it's actually the opposite. He's reclusive, protected, insulated, with an army of spin doctors and control freaks micromanaging every single reporter who's allowed to come near the great man. 
We have probably sent him a dozen invitations to appear on our show. Huh, are you kidding? No chance of that. Well, that's what our show is about today, about the evolution of Suzuki from the happy, chatty scientist to a reclusive crank, increasingly paranoid, increasingly prone to conspiracy theories, and moving further and further away from true science. Yesterday, for the first time, I managed to speak directly with Suzuki. He made a rare mistake and sent out a press release inviting reporters to come to a public announcement he was making, so I attended. When I showed up, the moment he spotted me in our Sun News cameras, he literally took shelter in a waiting car. Yeah, yeah, but that didn't stop us. We didn't give up. I actually got to confront the great man face to face, but more on that later. So what did I do to scare him so much? Was I too mean? And what was the public announcement that he had called us all together to hear? I'll tell you that and much, much more when we come right back on this special edition of The Source. Oh, we're talking about David Suzuki, a man of contradictions, the millionaire one percenter who talks like a Occupy Wall Street anarchist, the anti-oil activist who jets around the world and co-owns an island property with an oil company. Yesterday, I finally met him and our encounter was very revealing. But first, a bit more history. Look, it's not hard to like Suzuki. I think it's his eyes, they're always smiling. He has a gentle look, a gentle sound to him, and he's just been around for so long that he's like the wallpaper or the carpet, you're just sort of used to him. But part of the reason why he's so liked is because he's so under scrutinized. He's obsessive about how he controls access to his events and how those events are scripted and who's allowed to even be near him right down to the last detail of how his all-female security guards are supposed to dress. Here's John Abbott College's Jim Anderson, who was helping to recruit Suzuki's all-girl escort team from the student body. Here's his memo about their dress code, and I quote, Please be certain that the women are nicely dressed. We don't want them in evening gowns, but definitely not police tech uniforms. Yeah, when you've got people in charge of people, in charge of what your all-girl bodyguards are wearing, you just might be a bit of a control freak. So imagine when one of our reporters, Jessica Hume, actually dared to attend a Suzuki public meeting in Ottawa, and she didn't check with Suzuki's staff first about what she was allowed to wear, you know, being what Suzuki would call a female lady. She didn't check with Suzuki's staff first about what questions she was allowed to ask either. She didn't want to be part of the PR team like the National Film Board or the John Abbott College staff or the CBC. Jessica wanted to be, what's that word again? Oh yeah. A reporter. Well, take a look what happened. How can we help you today? Um, I don't think you can. We're just waiting for David Suzuki. Well, this is, uh, I'm not going to allow you to take pictures in the section. Hey, Jessica, that's awesome. I'm asking you not to videotape me because I have really bad body image issues and I don't want to be on camera. I'm asking you to leave. Like, this we're isn't... asking you to leave. I think you're being really difficult. We have no. to I'm ask glad that you think Suzuki that I... one question. Then, and we're saying no. I tell you, if I didn't allow cameras because I had body image issues, we would never have a show. Anyway, Suzuki prefers pre-scripted questions from grade school kids. And if his John Abbott College rules are any guide, he likes the women he meets to be pre-selected too. Yeah, we don't do that here at The Sun, which is why Suzuki won't talk to us. Now, if he were a private man, that's fine. There's no obligation for a private person to talk to a public news media. But Suzuki is not a private man. He's a political partisan campaigning alongside liberal premiers. He does hectoring nanny state public service ads trying to shame people into using less energy like this. David Suzuki? Hey, Bob. Just getting rid of this old fridge. But I'm using it. It uses 1,250 kilowatt hours of electricity every year. That's about 150 bucks. Yeah, that's coming from the guy who co-owns part of an island with an oil company. Yeah, I'd better unplug my beer fridge for him, eh? But the bigger point is that Suzuki has spent his life living off the avails of taxpayers. First as a professor, then as a broadcaster, the tax funder funded CBC, and now more and more in $41,000 speeches at taxpayer-funded schools like John Abbott College. And of course, his biggest deal is his massive David Suzuki Foundation, his lobby group that has somehow managed to convince Revenue Canada that it's a charity, like a food bank or a homeless shelter is, 
so it doesn't have to pay taxes, so it can actually issue tax receipts for donations, you know, to pay for important charity work like hiring nine lobbyists. I mean, in one way, he's a hell of an entrepreneur, amassing such a fortune, but in another way, he's not an entrepreneur at all. He's just gaming the system, the CBC, the National Film Board, colleges, all government institutions, but it's not just the money. It's the total lack of scrutiny he faces from the Canadian media. Of course, the CBC will never ask him a tough question. They employ him. And that's about half of all reporters in Canada at the CBC. And the rest have been largely co-opted, too, ideologically, their fellow travelers with them. I mean, just one quick example of how the media in Canada treats Suzuki in ways that no other politician would get away with. Uh, I'll give you an example. So, so Suzuki has made millions of dollars off the CBC. Not just directly, but being on the CBC is what's made him famous enough to start his mega foundation and to charge 41 grand to visit junior colleges. So a couple of years ago, three years ago, Suzuki released a film about himself. And of course, it's mainly about his CBC career. So of course, the CBC co-produced the movie. They bought the TV rights. It's a CBC film about a CBC guy. And so the film was about to premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. Okay, sounds great. But let me show you how Suzuki works how well-trained he has the Canadian media, including his bosses. Yeah, who's the real boss? Look at this letter about the film's premiere, written from Suzuki's staff at his foundation to staff at the CBC, where he also works. Look at this letter. Let me quote. As a partner in David's career, we would like to ask that CBC participate in this celebration by purchasing a table sponsorship at the event. I will be in touch shortly to discuss this opportunity and be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Purchase a table at the premiere, but, but they produce the movie. The, it's, it's theirs? That's like asking someone to buy a ticket to their own birthday party? Okay, fine. I mean, it was a dinner, right? So how much would a ticket cost? A nice meal, maybe 50 or 100 bucks? Well, Suzuki staff sent a whole price list to the CBC. Here's what it said. Yeah, take a look. Two tickets start a $10,000, that's not a typo, $10,000 for two tickets. Oh, and you get your name in the program. 10,000 bucks from the CBC for the privilege of two people attending the launch of their own movie. But for a whole table, prices are $25,000 to $50,000 for a table for a couple of hours to have dinner at the movie's premiere. And the main sponsorship table is $100,000. You actually get two tables for that. A hundred thousand dollars demanded of the film's producer for the privilege of sitting next to the lead actor at the dinner for the premiere. Did, did the CBC laugh at this? Did they delete the email? Did they sue? No, they set up meetings to get the sponsorship going. The only question was how much money. So the negotiations began and a contract was drafted up. Oh, and it didn't just include the CBC giving Suzuki money for coming to dinner. The CBC had to also agree to give Suzuki access to their news shows. Here, here's an email we got from Access to Information Request showing Suzuki's demands. Look at this. Suzuki wanted an interview on the radio show Q. He wanted a feature interview on The Hour with George Strombolopoulos. Oh yeah, while he's at it, a feature interview on the national news. Because of course, Suzuki's autobiography is certainly national news worthy of a feature interview. Well, actually, Suzuki was savvy enough to know that it wasn't, so he had to get it in the contract, along with radio interviews and movie reviews that they were contractually obliged to provide. Just to be clear, the CBC was paying Suzuki the, for the privilege of him coming on their shows. They were paying him. He's promoting his own movie. He's already a CBC employee. They already bought the movie rights. And now they're being asked to pay for the privilege of him coming on their shows to talk about his movie that they already bought? Oh, and it gets better. You see, the host of the hour, George Strombolopoulos, he's a board member of Suzuki's foundation. He works with Suzuki. So let's recap. David Suzuki demands that the CBC pay David Suzuki for the privilege of David Suzuki appearing on a CBC show hosted by another Suzuki board member, all to talk about a David Suzuki film about David Suzuki incestuous much yeah it reminded me of that movie being john malkovich 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 
Malkovich. Suzuki, 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 Suzuki. Yeah, in business, that's what's known as a non-arm's length deal. In politics, that would be against a conflict of interest law. Even senators aren't allowed to do that. But at the CBC, what the hell, right? I mean, it's only the sucker public's money. There's never a recession at the CBC or in Suzukiville. But still, a hundred grand gift probably needed a middle manager at the CBC to sign off. And it looks like the CBC wasn't being quite quick enough to pay their tithe to St. Suzuki. Look at this email exchange we got through an access information request. This is the Suzuki staff from the Suzuki Foundation writing a passive-aggressive letter to a CBC staffer named Bridget. Let me read. Hi, Bridget. Here's what I thought I was discussing with CTV today or tomorrow. Please let me know how CBC can best add value to this event. That's code for giving money. And then it would have been devastatingly embarrassing for David not to have offered any of these opportunities to CBC because we could not connect? Okay, let me translate. Sure, Suzuki has been with the CBC for nearly 50 years. They've given him everything he has. They paid for the film, they made him. But if they don't pony up big, Suzuki might just have to walk across the street and sell his love to CTV instead. Boy, that sure would embarrass the CBC. Uh, yeah, right. Could you believe it? Well, the CBC did believe it. They caved. They bought the sponsorship for a film they already owned. Oh, and not just two tickets, a big table plus some more. The CBC blacked out the final dollar amount, but it looks like they either paid the 50 grand or the 100 grand package by what they got. So to go to their own movie premiere. Now I show you this not just to reveal how Suzuki has gamed the system how he personally and his foundation have become multi-multi-millionaires, not just to show how a man becomes a one percenter, even though he works for the taxpayer, I show it to you for the opposite side of the story too, to show you just how compliant and supine and obedient the media in Canada are, how they're willing to sell their own TV shows to Suzuki, I mean pay him to come on? Even competitors bought tickets at this event, including the National Post. It's not just that the Suzuki Foundation took all the money is that he evades any public scrutiny for it. If a politician behaved this way, it would be a scandal. I mean, remember the big kerfuffle when Justin Trudeau was charging tr charities 20 grand a pop? That was truly scandalous for a sitting MP to do, to charities no less. But at least Trudeau was shamed into stopping it. And at least it was just $20,000, not $100,000, to come to a movie you already bought. I tell you this to explain why Suzuki so deeply hates the sun and me in particular. I show you this to prepare you for the footage of my encounter with him yesterday on the streets of Toronto to prepare you for his bizarre antics, his running away, his childlike aggression, his evasions. So no more paper documents now. What's next in the show is video. After the break, I'll show you what happened when I finally came face to face with Suzuki, but surprised him by not dropping to my knees like the rest of his fan club in the media. Don't you move a muscle. Welcome back. David Suzuki's getting old. He's 77, but he's still fit as a fiddle. Here's a picture of him posing nude when he was 70. I'd like to look that good, well, right now. He keeps a grueling schedule jetting from Australia to Vancouver to Bhutan to Toronto, and that's all just in the past month or two. I mean, he bills 75,000 bucks for an overseas speech. That would make a guy willing to fly to Australia. He's fit. And I think he's still mentally quite sharp, but when you're so rich and so powerful, but so paranoid of critics and so controlling, I think you start to see things. You start to project your own problems on other people. Here, here's what I mean by that. Here's some video David Suzuki has for years called for politicians who disagree with him on global warming to be jailed. He just plain says that. It's not enough for him to disagree with people. He wants to punish them and remove them from society. Here, he said it as recently as m last month when he visited Australia. Now, if you have people who uh, stand up to take positions of leadership and they deliberately suppress or ignore information vital to making an informed decision, I think that's willful blindness. 
And willful blindness, I understand, is a legal, uh, a legal entity that you can sue people for. But are you seriously suggesting that politicians should be tried and possibly even jailed for exercising free well, speech? Well, I throw it out as something that ought to be brought up. Uh, I haven't really uh, thought it through to the end. Yeah, hasn't thought it through, but he's been saying it about his enemies for a long time. Easier to lock them up, I suppose, than to debate them. We saw a bit of that when he locked out Jessica Hume from that Ottawa event and when they banned us from returning to the National Film Board event. But here's what I mean. He's 77 now, and he's been thinking of jailing his opponents for so long, he's come to believe that maybe they want to jail him too in return. Here, he said that at a Vancouver street rally about a month ago. We have a government, the Harper government, that, has, um, that wants to expand the prison system in spite of the fact that crime rates are dropping. Now, I'm not a guy that tends to think that uh, there are all these uh, obscure uh, things that are going on we don't know about, but quite frankly, are we expanding the prison system because the Harper government intends to create new uh, areas of criminality? How about eco-terrorists? How about radical extremists? Is that what's gonna fill our jails? In the coming years? Yeah, that's called projection. And he said it again when he was in Australia at that show we showed you. Here, take a look. We now have a government that is uh, increasing, making a major commitment to increasing the number of prisons at a time when the rate of crime has been dropping steadily over the last 10 years. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm not a guy that thinks about conspiracies, but I'm wondering whether our prime minister thinks he's gonna be creating new categories of crime like eco-terrorism or uh, as he calls us, environmental radicals, uh, radical extremists. But anyway, there is a very well, strong- With all due respect, that does sound like a conspiracy theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In my moments, I do kind of uh, wonder. Yeah, even his polite Australian host had to point out he was uh, sounding like a crazy man. Now, a Canadian reporter would never have pushed back, would never have said that the emperor has no clothes. A Canadian reporter would, would bow down. Who knows? Maybe cut Suzuki a check for $100,000. That Australian there wasn't as well trained. But a leading Canadian going around the world telling people that Canada is building new prisons to lock up environmentalists, it's embarrassing. Someone might believe him. So our Justice Minister, Peter McKay, felt obligated to make a public statement saying, yeah, no, the old man's gone tinfoil hat on us, remember? I, I want to clarify one thing. We have not and do not intend to build more prisons or mega prisons. This is, again, pure mythology. Um, you know, David Suzuki is a public figure. Uh, he's entitled to his opinions. But to deliberately spread mistruths in another country about our justice system, I suggest, is inappropriate and irresponsible. Uh, something he can't be jailed for, but it is something that he should seriously ponder before he makes such absurd comments about our system. It's a bit sad that no reporters ever followed up on Suzuki's nuttiness. I mean, except for Australian reporters, right? It fell to our justice minister to say, no, the government isn't sending environmentalists to jail especially an environmentalist who actually has been employed quite richly by the government broadcaster for 40 years. But I think Suzuki has begun to believe it anyways. I mean, it makes sense. He regards himself as a semi-religious figure. I, I wouldn't quite say a cult leader, more a New Age oracle who loves combining hippie Zen sayings with a few dollops of scientific jargon, sort of like Deepak Chopra, but in a lab coat. And if Deepak Chopra worked for the government. So what happens when you're a quasi-religious figure You've made your millions and you're in the twilight of your life. Is there anything more? How does it end? Well, every wannabe Jesus needs his martyrdom. I mean, you can't be a hero if you haven't been tested in battle. You can't become supernatural. You can't become godlike unless you're persecuted. If, G if Suzuki wants to be like Jesus, who would be Pontius Pilate? Well, the conservative government, of course, except that as I just showed you, the conservatives really don't want to kill Suzuki or jail him. In fact, the conservatives are... Pretty generous to Suzuki. They didn't fire him from the CBC when Suzuki campaigned with Dalton McGinty in election. They, they've even let Suzuki have a charitable status for his lobby firm. But damn it, Suzuki's a martyr. Just ask him. And so if that's not reality, perhaps it could be done in fantasy. And so a big money foundation headquartered in the United Kingdom called the Cape Farewell Foundation that hates the oil sands decided to help. If Harper's conservatives wouldn't play along, to make Suzuki a martyr, well, they would. 
So this UK-based foundation gave an enormous grant to the Royal Ontario Museum to wage a PR war against the oil sands. They funded a whole anti-carbon campaign to demonize oil and gas. And part of it was the idea of pretending that Suzuki really was being persecuted by the evil Harper regime for Suzuki's environmental views. So they paid for a whole propaganda effort, a website and a live show. They called it the Trial of David Suzuki, where we would all go through the motions of prosecuting Suzuki for his views, even though that will never happen. It has not only been ruled out, but no one even suggested it. He's the one who suggested it for others. Here, here's a quick clip from that Trial of Suzuki website where he describes our dear country, Canada, as a thuggish place. Look. George Monbiot writes, Canada, a liberal, cultured, decent country, has been transformed into a thuggish petrostate. I believe this is who we are. Oh, shut up. We're so thuggish that you've been working for the government here for 40 years. But hey, the fantasy works for him. He's the star. He's the martyr. Oh, and there's lots of money involved. So yesterday, the trial of Suzuki sent out a press release inviting journalists to come to an important announcement featuring the great man himself. Well, I was delighted to receive the invitation. So I went. We got there early, so I waited in the car for a bit. Suzuki was early, too, and he was chatting with other reporters and staff probably for five minutes just standing there. So I thought, well, you know, Maybe I'll go talk to him before the event starts. We've got 15 minutes. So we started walking, me and two cameramen. We were pretty obvious, I guess. I mean, the Sun logo was on our equipment, and I look like me. There's nothing I can do about that. So when Suzuki saw us, well, he immediately stopped talking to people and jumped in his car. But he was just sitting there in the car, and it was a press conference. I mean, I hadn't come uninvited. I wasn't crashing a private party that I needed a $100,000 dinner ticket for. I wasn't at one of his four homes. This was a press conference on the street. Would he conference with me? Well, I thought I would try. Can I talk to you for a minute, David? Can I talk to you for a minute? Can I talk to you later? I've got to rush off for another I thought you had this uh, event right now. Pardon me? I thought you had an event here right now. Are you running away from me? I did. No, no. I'm preparing my notes for the event. Do you have a minute to talk? You were talking with them. Is How come you don't want to talk with me? Is it because I ask skeptical because questions? You distort and you don't tell the truth. Well, tell me the truth. What's the truth? Do you have a... I don't want to talk to Sun News because you don't tell the truth. What, what's the truth? What's the truth, David? What truth are we not saying? What truth are we not saying, David? Wasn't that weird? I mean, he would open the door for a moment, <laughs> blurt out some insult or accusation, and then close the door like he was worried I was going to, I don't know, kiss him or give him cooties or something. Look, he said we don't tell the truth about him. I've shown you lots of video clips of himself talking in his own voice and lots of primary documents about him. I've invited him on the show a dozen times to make his case. He hasn't accepted. What facts did I get wrong? Well, he wouldn't say. But I do know this. He watches the show enough to know that he hates it and hates me, enough to jump out of a public press conference and into a car. Now, there were at least 10 staff at this event, Suzuki staff, Museum staff, foreign foundation staff, publicists, handlers, and of course, some pretty girls like they had at John Abbott College. And they were all busy texting and emailing on their smartphones in panic that I was there. Me, I was just waiting around. I mean, I was an invited guest. I hadn't done anything wrong. But they made a crisis management decision. Get the saint out of there! So he sped away in his Chevy Volt. Well, I moseyed on over to the official podium where the organizer of the event, looking extremely stressed out, started things off. Oh, and it won't surprise you one bit to learn that when she's not doing propaganda events against fossil fuels with David Suzuki, her day job is working at the CBC as a producer. I love David Suzuki, which is a theatrical event that's going to be happening on November 6th at the ROM in the Corelli Court. And this is part of an exhibition called Carbon 14 that's put on by Cape Farewell. Carbon-14, Cape Farewell, that's the key point. This wasn't a balanced debate. This was an anti-carbon event, bought and paid for by an anti-oil foundation. 
and she was only too happy to participate in it as a CBC staffer. I mean, remember, it was being styled as a trial of Suzuki, which is absurd, for he's committed no crime. The justice minister said as much. But the whole point of this theatrical event was to pretend that it could happen, that Suzuki could be in jeopardy, that he's at risk. So they found some Toronto lawyers willing to play the role of Harper's goons, prosecuting a saint because we live in, what's that word again? Oh yeah, a petro state. Here, watch. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to the, our head of prosecution. It's Will McDowell from Lenser Slat. Will McDowell. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, we live in a petro economy, as we all know, and Dr. Suzuki has amassed a body of work over a number of years in which he's questioned the foundations of the economy, and that's all fair. But recently, his writing has reached a new level, and we say that at this point, he is knowingly damaging Canada, and he's knowingly damaging Canada in a way that amounts to the offense of sedition. Yeah, first of all, we don't live in a petro state. All energy in Canada, oil, gas, nuclear, coal, everything, is only... 6.8% of our economy. See, it's propaganda to call it a petrostate. But this lawyer was fulfilling his role as the caricature of a rich, fat cat, evil Harper lawyer who would call Suzuki's commentary sedition. In fact, Harper, for some reason, calls it charitable work and gives Suzuki tax-free status for it. But do you see what this is? It's an attempt to build the narrative of Suzuki as a victim instead of as a bully himself. I put that to the fake prosecutor. Why is he pretending Suzuki is the victim when in fact Suzuki is the one who's called for others to be jailed? So what about Suzuki calling for other people to be put in jail? Suzuki has said skeptics of climate change should be put in jail. What do you think of his comments of jailing politicians? Well, I don't know, Ezra. I don't know whether he's got a view of but you're for. How come we're not prosecuting that? How come we're pretending he's the victim instead of the one actually calling for people to be put in jail? All right, now I think that we should meet. Would you like to answer that one? I am the creator of a theatrical event. Wait, why did you have Suzuki as the victim when he's the one actually looking to put politicians in jail? Uh, there is no victim here. There is no victim here. This is a theatrical event that starts a discussion about the end of oil. Oh, wasn't that great? That's very telling. She was honest. That last comment. This was a theatrical discussion to promote a discussion about the end of oil. That's what she's doing. So, of course, Suzuki's the victim. And, of course, oil companies are the bullies. Those were the explicit terms by which the Royal Ontario Museum and this CBC producer got their grant money. Of course, that was a stupid question. Money, eh? Well, I'm glad she mentioned it. I thought, I, I thought I'd ask about that. Look. How much foreign funding did you receive for this project? Uh, no funding. No funding for the project, eh? You just told us you were funded. I didn't say I was... From the Carbon 14 Group, and you mentioned the foundation. No, no, no. they haven't given me any money for this. Oh, for this project. I didn't say you personally. How much money did this project take? I need to sell tickets to get in on November 6th to go to the ROM, and that is what is paying for this event. But that's not quite true, because foundation money is coming in from the United States to pay for this anti-oil sands exercise, isn't it? Uh, Can I ask you a question? We will You're have trying... a funding talk a little later on. Well, why, why not now? Because I want to introduce you to the head of defense. She's wrong. She said there was no foundation money. You heard her. But I actually met the foundation boss. He was there. He's actually an Englishman. He was at the event. Nice guy. Uh, would the CBC producer, the Suzuki PR gal, lie to me? Is that show business when you're out to demonize oil companies? You say whatever you need to say? Well, after all these boring lawyers spoke, the great man himself did finally reappear. He had been hiding from me, but he sneaked in from the back. No problem. I was very eager to hear what he had to say. I like how he started. My name is David Suzuki. I stand here today as an elder with none of the temptations of power, fame, or money. I don't speak for any group or organization. I speak for myself as a grandfather. I have no hidden agenda but to speak the truth. I like that, eh? No temptations of power or fame or money. I like how he says he doesn't speak for any other groups, but we know that he likes money. He bills 41 grand for his speech. We know his foundation rings tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars out of the CBC. We don't know the exact amount. And we know that his name and face are the central brand of his multi-million dollar foundation. Its website URL is the name davidsuzuki.org. How on earth could he say he's not about money, fame, or power? And that he doesn't speak for anyone other than himself. Look at their website. 
And this is at an event bought and paid for by an anti-carbon extremist group headquartered overseas. But I was patient, so I got to hear this. I accuse corporations from the automobile sector to energy, chemicals, agriculture and pharmaceuticals of putting profit and growth before all else, including the survival and health of society. Huh? Pharmaceutical companies, agriculture, energy, they're a problem for the survival and health of society. So companies that make medicine are endangering our health. So farmers and electricity companies threaten civilization as in it's better without them. Maybe he's a kook if he believed it, but we know he jointly owns part of an island with an oil company. We know he's got about 10 million bucks of his own foundation's money in investments. Oh, I wonder what stocks he's invested in if he's ruled out energy, agriculture, and pharmaceuticals. But it gets better. Look. It is shameful that corporate lobbying is setting our country's agenda. Was that, was, um, corporate lobbying is setting Canada's agenda? Did he momentarily forget that his own foundation has nine registered corporate lobbyists in Ottawa? If it's so shameful, why is he doing it times nine? Right. I accuse Canadian corporations and government of immoral activity, pursuing ends with devastating consequences to the poorest, most vulnerable nations in the world. Right, like the super poor country of Bhutan. Poorer than North Korea, 62% of women are illiterate in Bhutan. They have a lower life expectancy than North Korea. It's a brutal dictatorship that ethnically cleansed one-seventh of its population. Where David Suzuki has an adventure tour business, charging rich Canadians 6800 bucks each to jet over there with him first class to enjoy the countryside. Got it. Look, it went on. I'll just skip to the end of his talk. If my words are judged treasonous, then so be it. Let the people decide on November 6th at the ROM. Yeah, buddy, no one has called your words treasonous. Nobody, except for your paid publicists funded by a foreign foundation who think this will somehow embarrass the oil industry. No one has said you're treasonous. A hypocrite, sure. A blathering idiot. Indeed, some have said it. But you're the one who is calling, he's called for your opponents to be jailed. You're the one who wants to throw people in the clink. Well, he finally ended his speech, and I was standing right there, two feet away from him. So I asked him a question, and this time he couldn't hide behind a car door. What do you think I asked him? And what do you think he said? I'll show you <laughs> right after the break. All right, so there I was. He had called me a liar before when he locked himself in his rented Chevy Volts, but he wouldn't tell me what I'd lied about. So he had finished his big speech, and I had listened politely, and it was called a press conference, and I had been invited, and I was told the event would last 40 minutes long, so I thought, you know, I'd ask a question. Not the questions he's used to being asked, like, who do I make the check out to, or is, is my dress pretty enough? But, you know, a question that a PhD, a journalistic pro, a great public figure like him might have been able to answer, so I tried. And look what happened. Aren't you the one who's actually asked people uh, for politicians to be put in jail? That ought to be no one, for you. No one's ever, no, but no one's ever uh, asked for you to be put in jail. Uh, you've asked for politicians to be put in jail. Do you, do you still think that people who disagree with you should be put in jail? Not people who disagree with me, people who fail to act properly in the interest of future generations. But you don't act properly. You have three homes. You jet around the world. You were in Australia. Ezra. You jetted here. Ezra. Why, why should others go to jail why when you're a biggest carbon Ezra. consumer I know? Why should I talk to you when you know what your story is and what you're going to get out of this? Well, but you, and you don't, you simply don't do it Sorry, please don't touch Sorry. me. Sorry. Excuse me, Dave. All right, can I get in? But how come, uh, have you talked to uh, Harriet Sachs? Have you talked to Harriet Sachs, the, the sitting judge on this? No, I haven't. Very brave man. <laughs> That's a press conference, David Suzuki style. I mean, is there an answer he could have given? Would it have taken him any longer to actually point out an error I have made? then try to say nothing while walk away. I mean, we know he's watched the show because he says it's lies. Why couldn't he have just said the truth then to put me in my place? I mean, he's a PhD, a thoughtful man. Why nothing? Because it's tough explaining why you have to use less while he enjoys his four homes. I was wrong. 
yesterday when I said he only had three. It's tough pretending that you're a victim of bullying when you're not, but in fact, you want other people in jail. But did you, did you hear the last thing I asked him? I mentioned the name Harriet Sachs. That's the name of the judge who's going to preside over this fake trial of Suzuki. Now, it's one thing for real lawyers to play a role. That's sort of what a lawyer is, an actor who's passionate for his client, no matter who his client is. Lawyers don't have to be neutral. In fact, most of the time, they have to be as adversarial as they can be, even more than they might normally be in real life. But what is the propriety of a real sitting judge from the real Ontario Superior Court to come down from running real trials to participate in what clearly is an anti-oil theatrical stunt? I mean, don't take it from me. Here's that PR clip from the, the woman running the thing one more time. I love David Suzuki which is a theatrical event that's going to be happening on November 6th at the Rome in the Corelli Court. And this is part of an exhibition called Carbon 14 that's put on by Cape Farewell. She's the one who said it's about to start a discussion against oil. This is an anti-oil, anti-carbon theatrical stunt bought and paid for by foreign foundations. I mean, that's great for a political debate, but should a judge be part of such an obvious campaign? Put it another way, if a similar bit of political theater were to be bought and paid for by, say, the company proposing the Keystone XL pipeline to put on a trial, say, of, oh, I don't know, the pipeline itself. And the whole thing would be skewed to suit the PR needs of the pipeline, say, if it were phrased as, which is better for America, buying ethical oil from Canada or Saudi conflict oil, something that's a very pro-oil advocacy kind of message. Would a sitting judge ever allow herself to participate in that? If not, why the opposite campaign team? I was truly surprised to hear it. I mean, judges participate in mock trials all the time, usually in law school to train students in advocacy, or sometimes for fun as a public delight. Just the other day, the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court took part in a mock trial out at Stratford, Ontario, where they have all the Shakespeare plays. It was the trial of Shylock, the Merchant of Venice. What a great entertainment. Fun, literate, historical, a public delight. Not a true educational event, but fun. And completely non-political. There is no chance whatsoever that that same judge who participated in a trial of a fictitious character in a Shakespeare play would ever risk losing the perception of independence in her real job. I mean, Shakespeare is long dead. Shylock never lived. There is no chance of a real matter presenting in court like this. But there is a very real chance of oil sands and pipelines and government regulations affecting energy presenting themselves before Canada's courts. The major strategy of foreign foundations besides propaganda is lawsuits. How could a judge who participates in such an obvious PR stunt not help but get caught up in the politics of the campaign? You heard it. It's anti-carbon. That's what they call the foundation project. It's not a fair fight. The whole premise is biased to imply Canada is brutal to dissenters. The prosecutors are caricatures of the government. It's not even about whether Suzuki is acquitted or convicted of the fake crime of this stunt. It's the stunt itself. It's a PR stunt. Why on earth would a sitting judge do that? But there's one other reason why Judge Sachs' involvement isn't sitting right. And I'll tell you why next. We're talking about the judge of this fake trial. Well, Justice Harriet Sachs just happens to be married to Canada's leading environmentalist lawyer named Clayton Ruby. Here they are dining together for a special in the Toronto Star. Now, Clayton Ruby just happens to have filed a month ago a lawsuit against the Canadian government on behalf of a foreign foundation called Forest Ethics, suing the Conservative government, alleging that its new oil sands regulatory rules are too easy on the industry and too tough on environmentalists. Now, of course, it's absolutely possible that there is a sort of firewall between a husband, who's an activist lawyer for groups like Greenpeace, and a wife who is a neutral judge in court. Of course it's possible. You have to be very careful, but it happens fairly often. Lawyers often marry each other, and one sometimes gets called to be a judge. But what about the perception, even if there is no real bias at all, what about the perception of bias that Justice Sachs was participating in the same activist campaigns that her husband likes to do? In fact, Greenpeace is an official partner of the Cape Farewell Foundation that sponsored this whole thing. They have been a client of his. I mean, earlier this summer, Justice Sachs was presiding over a very serious environmental lawsuit. If a party to that lawsuit knew that Justice Sachs was going to be part of a Suzuki campaign stunt funded by an anti-oil group, would they have thought that the trial they were getting was fair? Even if the judge tried her best to be fair, even if she really was fair, how could it not be a subconscious worry in the minds of the parties that the judge maybe had sympathies to one side of the debate? 
look, I do not want to jump to conclusions about the judge's role. I'm not jumping to conclusions about the event itself, though. You heard it from the organizers. This is a theatrical stunt as part of an anti-oil campaign. They said it. It's as partisan and contentious and political as it gets. Elections are being fought over this right now. Lawsuits are being filed over this right now, including by Clayton Ruby. Is Justice Sachs risking the independence of her office? Is participating in this risking even the perception of independence that it might look funny to the public? I sent a very detailed, respectful note to Justice Sachs yesterday. I asked her for the facts. I asked her for her comments. I told her my basic arguments that I was going to use today, and I asked if she thought I was wrong or unfair. I told her she could reply, or if she preferred, a spokesman could reply, in writing or by phone or in person, whatever. I wanted to be very courteous. I love taking on political hacks like Suzuki and those lawyers I was tangling with can handle themselves too, but I didn't want to lightly criticize the conduct of a sitting judge without cause. I wanted to make sure I was fair. Here's part of my letter I sent to the judge. I am very critical of the anti-oil lobby in Canada, and so it is important that I get the facts about your participation so I do not make inappropriate criticism based on false assumptions. I do not want to be unfair or to call into question your independence on political matters if that is not the case, unquote. Well, I regret that I never heard back from the judge. Earlier yesterday, her assistant told me on the phone that the judge just didn't want to speak to me. In my email, I asked her to reconsider. But one of the lawyers participating in the stunt made a passionate defense of the judge. So I'm going to show you that. It's the best I've got from her side of the story. If I hear more from Justice Sachs or anyone from the court, I promise I'll give you their side of the story too. Here's what one of the lawyers yesterday told me. How appropriate is it for a sitting judge whose husband is known as an environmental activist to participate in this propaganda exercise? Well, in my experience, um, and I've had to struggle with ethical issues of this sort many times, um, our judge has gone about this in precisely the right way, so that it's absolutely clear for the record. Did she run it by the judicial counsel yeah. first? No, she ran it by her chief justice, which is what she ought to do. You don't go to the judicial counsel for that. Let's just keep our tempers down about this, because it's very important that questions like that not have the inadvertent effect of drawing viewers to the wrong conclusion. She ensured that she had the approval of her Chief Justice. Is this approval in writing? Can we see it? I, I, that's not for me to know and I haven't inquired about that. So how do you know what happened? Because I accept the word of her that she obtained that and I think that's good enough in the business that I engage. But what about the perception? Let me finish my answer actually. Please don't be so rude. It's really important. What you're saying is really unfair, and it's really important that I be permitted a full opportunity to respond. I'm not her lawyer. I'm just telling you what but I You're know. part of this propaganda exercise. Look, I'm sorry. There is a difference between a mock trial about Shakespeare or in a law school for students versus a mock trial put on by Canada's most partisan environmental activist, David Suzuki. It just looks bad, and I'm worried that it will reflect on the office of the Superior Court. Justice Sachs probably has a tougher line to walk on this than other judges do since her husband is such an activist lawyer on this very issue. I just don't get it. I hope she'll reconsider. Not because I'm pro-oil and that's an anti-oil stunt. I would be equally shocked if a sitting judge participated in an oil company's PR exercise too. I mean, imagine the hue and cry from environmentalists like Clayton Ruby if that were to happen. Canada's anti-oil sands movement is huge. Foreign Foundations, the CBC, the National Film Board, the Royal Ontario Museum, the bulk of the media party, much of the legal profession. But for normal Canadians, oil and gas means jobs. For us or for friends and family, it means huge tax revenues that pays for our government services. And everyone, including St. Suzuki himself, uses the fruits of oil and gas to drive and fly around and also in plastics and chemicals that make everything from cell phones to our clothes. It's all under attack, and Suzuki is one of the loudest voices condemning the industry. Given his own massive personal consumption of fossil fuels, you'd think he wouldn't be so viciously against this stuff, but I think if there's one thing we've learned today, it's that how David Suzuki tells us to live is quite different from how he actually lives himself. Stick around, I'll have some final thoughts after the break. Look, I love debating oil and gas with guys like David Suzuki. I even debated Clayton Ruby once. What I don't like is when public institutions like the CBC, like the museum, 
and God forbid our courts allow themselves to be, well, perceived as being on one side of this partisan issue. Folks, we keep fighting for freedom here at The Sun. I'll tell you one thing, we're on your side. Bye-bye.